Hello, everyone. My name is Gerhard Klimek. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Purdue University, and I'm the director of NanoHub. I'd like to share with you some experiences we've gathered with NanoHub and show you new paradigms in global scientific knowledge transfer, publishing, and assessment. So what's NanoHub and who is there? We have about 2 million users annually. And as you see in this animation, it is really never sleeping. We have users there 24 seven, 12 months a year. We have over 2,400 contributors. We have users in 172 countries. These users are typically faculty, students, and industry practitioners. If you look at a global picture <clears throat> or a static image, you can see that we really cover the globe with users. Whether there's a civilization that can light up the night sky with light, we have nanohub users, people interested in nanotechnology. So <clears throat> what is on nanohub? We have over 700 apps that are tools, simulation apps that are running in the cloud without installing anything. We have over 6,500 lectures and tutorials, 170 courses. Uh, we are really like a MOOC. And we are a cyber infrastructure that has a 99.4% uptime with 24 seven operation. How do we measure impact? And that will be part of my presentation today. We have NanoHub tools that are now listed in the Web of Science and Google Scholar. So these are new types of publications. We measure impact also by people using us for research. So there's 2,500 papers that cite NanoHub in the literature. And these papers generated 54,000 secondary citations. So that would result in an H index of 105. We also have impact on education. And that's another component I will be talking about today. We can show that we have over 89,000 students that used these simulation tools in classes. And those were over 3,800 different classes at 185 institutions. And we can insert these tools rather rapidly in the classroom um, with less, less than six months of adoption after publication. So what I'm showing you here are really fundamental changes in approaches and underlying assumptions. We are publishing research-based tools and use them for other people's research, and we insert them into education. That was previously not really possible in nanotechnology. That's a fundamental change in the underlying assumption of what is possible. We also created a new type of publication, simulation tools that are now listed in the web of science. Again, that was not previously feasible or demonstrated. So these I would call new paradigms. So <clears throat> to me, these are existence proofs and we can do much more in other fields of science, but let me focus on NanoHub and its core capabilities here. So here's another example of a revolutionary invention. It's an innovative capability example. You see the first uh, car by Benz with a uh, gas powered engine. It was a kind of a special vehicle. Um, you had to be pretty rich to run it, uh, own it. You had to have a driver and the driver was also the mechanic most likely and also the person that gets the gas and services the uh, vehicle. And what the real breakthrough uh, with automobiles was that they became usable and accessible. And that really had impact where a person um, can really use them for commerce, <clears throat> and they're affordable and accessible. So the first one on the top left certainly is an innovation, but really to make it have impact, it needed to be usable and accessible. And you've seen similar pictures here with tablets, PCs being available way before iPads, but you had to read a 200 page manual to really get something going there. Versus we know that iPads can be used by children that can't even really read. So it again was usability, accessibility that generated impact. So if you're in the field of nanoscience and material science, you can typically see um, uh, tools like Nemo and Abinit and games. Uh, and these words might mean something to you if you're a computational scientist in that field. But uh, uh, these tools are really very similar to this. Uh, these tools are like this car and the driver is kind of the graduate student with an X term that is operating these tools on a supercomputer 
and the, the guy in the back that's me the fat professor that tells the student what to do now what nano have been able to do is we put user interfaces onto these tools and made them useful for more people and when we've done that and make them interactive tools we've seen significant growth in our user numbers and that is where the true impact is and we can have the impact then of publishing these tools and make them useful again to many other people and personally i'm I do work in the software called Nemo. I have my own tool set running in NanoHub. There's nine Nemo derived tools that deal with quantum dots, transistors and graphene, et cetera. And people can just utilize these tools in a very simple way. So how do we measure impact? So we do extensive studies um, and, and track citations in the literature. So here's a social network chart of each dot being a paper in the uh, in in the literature and we color code them by fields so in red we have the nano science papers in the yellow circle here or um, enclosing um, surface these are papers that are somewhat affiliated with us but the key element that is that most papers are outside of the ncn the organization i represent and what's interesting is you have computer scientists reporting talking about NanoHub, and you have educators that use NanoHub and write papers about education with NanoHub. And we have we can measure about 7% of these authors are in industry. <clears throat> and we can also color code these plots by uh, whether there is experimental data in these papers. So these are computational science papers um, uh, original tools that now are serving experimental work and there's experimentalists using this tool so this is really translational that we uh, uh, translate research into other people's research so these are our own research tools from the contributors that are now being used by other people now let me see if we can measure also translational impact from research to education so what I'm wanting to show here is how we do that. So imagine you have this person and this person is using say the green tool on one day and then the next the person doesn't come back the next day and on day three and four the person uses the orange tool and then the green tool again. So you kind of get a somewhat of a scattered plot of a person showing up on NanoHub and doing their work. And if you see in the movie Matrix you might see something similar like this. So we have our own matrix, so to speak, where we have scattered data happening every day. But if you start to stare at it a little bit, you see patterns emerging, multiple patterns, another pattern, bigger chunks, and even huge chunks of people that seem to behave similarly and see these streaks. So we developed algorithms that cluster similar uh, pe uh, people behavior across time. So here you see a group of people that use the yellow tool. Here's a group of people that comes in a rhythmic pattern. Here is spring break in the middle. And you have other classes that use multiple tools. And what you can really measure is the number of students in a classroom over a semester. And this is really uh, behavior analysis. It's not a survey of pe what people are doing, but it's really measuring impact uh, by by behavior analysis. And again, that's a new paradigm rather than sending out surveys that are qualitatively qualitative, we can measure impact by quantitative impact metrics. And we have a bunch of classes that we can identify. <clears throat> As I mentioned, over 89,000 students, we've clustered like this over the years. And we can compare these users to say unclassified users that are behaving very erratically and it looks as if there's no coordinated behavior, but we can identify them as being experimental researchers or computational researchers. And that is again, translational research to research. And then we have an another group of people, about 50% of our users that we haven't classified. And that's what we'll continue to work on to engage them more. So we call those self-study users. Now, if I can measure classroom uh, attendance and classroom use of these tools, then these um, tools turn into classroom tools, right? They're no longer just research tools. And I can develop a metric from, say, very weak use 
in class and uh, strong views in class over here. Now, uh, we, I also showed you the social network charts of papers where I can measure impact from zero to one on research. And people think that these two are orthogonal to each other. The perception is that you either do research or you do education. But with the analytics we have now, we can show that the, some of the tools we have, a significant number is actually uh, being used for research and for education. And what's even cooler is that we can show how these um, tools evolve in time. I can go back to roughly 20 years of data where I don't know what a tool is going to be when it's born, so to speak, at the origin. And then I can see how tool usage evolves in time. And in 2002, we created NCN, Network for Computational Nanotechnology, to run NanoHub as a global effort. <clears throat> and we created an uh, infrastructure for interactive apps. And once we released that, it was much easier to contribute tools and also the tools became more popular. So you see the number of tools rising and also the number of uh, users on these tools rising significantly. And overall, you really see how these tools are migrating roughly from the research into education and they trickle into education. So the point is, this is what a fundamental educational institution should be doing, translating research into education. We can measure that first time to adoption into a classroom. Each tool has a digital object identifier. We can detect the first use in the classroom and we can measure the time to adoption. And that is happening very fast compared to a textbook update, which is roughly of the order of four years. Actually, the median adoption time of tool is roughly six months. And it happens in weeks and one or two months, really fast adoption into classrooms. Finally, I like to not just tell you that people are doing something, but I like to share a little bit of how they behave in these tools. The simulation tool is in many ways a, a, a design space that you can walk through, like the Grand Canyon. So you might take a, a, a small step, uh, you might uh, take a, a bigger step, multi, uh, vary three parameters, then you would get a thick dot like this. Then you might do another small modification. So you might walk through this design space from start to finish and change parameters in this design space. Now, this is a three-dimensional example, the XYZ flattened into two dimensions. Of course, the simulation tool might have 10, 20 parameters that can be changed and you end up flattening this n-dimensional space into two for visualization. So now I want to share you some, with you some real data, some real tool that is coming from the PN Junction Lab, which we acronymed PN Toy. So here you have a person that takes deliberate small steps and walks extensively from start to finish with different parameters. We call that person a wanderer or a searcher. Here's another example where a person takes relatively large steps and has a local exploration, another large step, local exploration, and homes in onto eventually a finished result like this. Again, we call this person a searcher. And then you have people that behave like that, where they, from start to finish, they take relatively large jumps to, uh, to get to a final result. And we call those people wildcatters. So these are quite different behaviors. And you can ask yourself in a distribution of say 2,700 simulation sessions by 1,800 users, how do they behave? We define something called a searchiness where we can ask ourselves how many people are wildcatters and how many people are searchers in this design space. And we find that most people are actually in this uh, categorization wildcatters. We can then also look at different classrooms that use these tools and different classrooms have also different behaviors. And we can begin to analyze educational behavior in these classrooms. So we can measure how people behave. We're further studying how that depends on the scaffolding that we have in the syllabus. What are the student types, grad students, undergrads, what's their experience? 
And we're asking ourselves, how can we report that back to instructors, maybe suggestions for collaborations, and maybe have suggestions for, for similar use cases. So with that, I'd like to conclude with our vision that we have for NanoHub, which is to accelerate innovation through user-centric science and engineering. And in our, that is our aspiration where we want to go. And what we do on a daily basis is to make science and engineering products that are usable, discoverable, reproducible, and easy to create for learners, educators, and business professionals. With that, I thank you very much for your attention.